This summer, my love and I got to go on a little vacation to New York where we got to visit the Genesee Country Village and Museum. It is the largest living history museum in New York and the third largest in America. How much are rooms? Well, which room do you want? <laughs> the nicest one. We're on vacation. Well, the most expensive one is 75 cents per person. Per person? Boy, Are yes. you kidding me? <laughs> if you can afford to travel by coach, you can darn well afford my prices. <laughs> All right, you're... All right. The Hosmer Inn housed travelers along the main route through western New York. It was one of the many resting stops for visitors on the Great Genesee County Road. Inns like these served as community gathering places where travelers could share news or even receive mail. This inn in particular was known for its great food and accommodations. We then visited the printing office where we got to see this mid-19th century Washington type press come to life. It was amazing to see something printed on a, it's an antique printing press that's still in use that can still print things and I got to watch it print something which was just so cool, so cool. I love historic trades. First the type had to be set and then the ink had to be rolled on, the paper then had to be set on it and then it was literally pressed it's a printing press so it was pressed and then it got cranked back out and there it is wanted a smart girl Then the ink is still wet, so they had to be hung to dry before you can stack them on top of each other or distribute them. Of course, I had to stop by the dressmaker shop. I mean, I am myself a historical dressmaker, so I thought it was so cool to see some of the very familiar uh, accessories and portraiture and fashion plates that went along with historical dressmaking, even though they didn't have a person there. And then we also got to see right next door the apothecary. One of the most meaningful buildings that I think we got to visit at this museum was the Brooks Grove Methodist Church that was built in 1844. And that's not just because of, of religious significance, but also family significance because we learned that day that Stephen's great, great, great grandfather actually was one of the preachers at this church. So we got to go in and see the building where one of the members of his family, one of his ancestors, got to preach. It is. Mm -hmm. 
I really wanted to ring the bell, but I resisted because there was a sign that said not to, and I don't want to hurt old things. We then visited Town Hall, which was built in 1822. In the upstairs of the town hall, there was in a gallery about stoneware pottery and a really cool clock. Next door was the Romulus Female Seminary, built in 1855. Private schools for girls started in western New York as early as 1800. At first, these schools were really just finishing schools, but later they taught more academic subjects such as grammar, geography, pronunciation, penmanship, English, and reading. One of the grandest houses at the museum was the Living Simbacus House, which was built from 1827 to 1838. It was originally built by James Livingston, who came from an old Hudson River family and got his fortune from milling, banking, and speculative ventures. The house then changed hands a couple of times before it came into the possession of Dr. Frederick Backus, who was an elected city official. It's a pomegranate right underneath um, that stands for wealth or prosperity, pineapple, and then the eucanthus leaves on the bottom in long life. Oh, wow. I love symbolism in architecture. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. They, it, you know, the newel post was carved out of one piece of wood, so it's very wow. neat. Here we have chicken croquettes. So that's the main meal. Then we have, yes, lots of We have a spice cake. Ooh. An Independence Day cake, a fruit cake, caraway seed tea cookies or tea cakes, as we would call them, and a strawberry cream. Ooh, lovely. This house was so fancy, it even had an indoor latrine at the back of the house, of course, right next to, well, the room where you store all of the wood, which, as a southerner, was uh, a new concept to me, because we don't have to have an indoor place to store wood. It doesn't normally get that cold. Now, outside, and the back of the house, they had a beautiful garden and garden house. My favorite feature of this garden was the garden house, which was built in 1828 in the federal style. And I kind of want one in my own backyard now because I just think it's so cool. It's like an enclosed gazebo. The gardens were laid out in a very classical style. It reminds me very much of an English garden, very much with the geometric shapes and everything is pruned so finely. Uh, it, it very much goes with the house, which is also very much done in a classical style. I would say the house is more of a Greek revival style. Uh, I very much enjoy architecture. Now, while we were in the garden, we actually spotted um, a house, which was behind the church, which we were like, oh my goodness, how did we miss this before? And it is not actually, but presented as a parsonage. And a parsonage would be where the ministry lived. So this is not actually the parsonage where Stephen's great-great-great-grandfather might have lived, but it's set up like it could have been, which again was really cool to see. And also it was in vast stark contrast to the, the wealth and splendor that we had just saw at the house we had just been in. This one was much, much simpler. And then of course a post office and then a tailor shop which there was actually a uh, living history interpreter in, and I had so much fun talking to them. This 
sewing machines, as these are actually relatively new technology at the construction of this building. It was built in 1849. The first sewing machine came out on the market in 1845. Wow. Um, and because of that, the general public did not trust the quality of the sewing machine. How could a machine possibly sew as good as a person? If you're using it, it's going to fall apart, and you're still charging high prices. Um, as a tailor, I know they're perfectly fine. <laughs> We then visited the tinsmith shop, which was built in 1860, and I got to see how one might use tin for making various objects. And I think the thing that surprised me the most is that tin is very malleable. It's it's still, you know, a, a metal and therefore hard to shape, but it's much easier to shape than I guess I expected. And I was really cool to see how that happened. The tinsmith, living history interpreter, was making a small medallion that was then going to be punctured, or um, I, I guess there might be a more scientific word for it, but uh, it, it basically is, is going to be then punctured in a pattern and then you can make it into an ornament. It was then getting late in the day, time had just flown by as we were exploring the historic trades, and we hadn't even made it to the Gaslight District, so we ran all the way back there to the Hamilton House, which was the only one still open, which was built in 1870. It is the Victorian Italianate style house with an L-shaped structure. Built by a man named John Hamilton, who was originally a shoemaker, he then purchased several tanneries and the demand for leather during the Civil War made him a very rich man. As I walked into the Hamilton house, one of the workers there looked really familiar, but I was like, where do I know this person from? And then I realized it was from Instagram. I got to meet Annalise and she is so lovely. You might know her as Young Sophisticate on Instagram or The Sophisticate on Facebook. And she also has a blog. If you are not familiar with her work, you should definitely go check it out because it is amazing. And I will link it down below. We then looked at the carriage house on our way out and it started raining, but we had such a lovely time out the village and also we didn't get to see everything that we actually came back the next day. This time we started off in the Pioneer Settlement, which is one of the sections of the village. And I really enjoyed that they had animals present. We started off at the Hetchler House, which angers the Pioneer Farmstead. At work, when he comes in in the evening, he has supper, which is a small meal of leftovers. <laughs> so on the table we have corn meal in all of the different ways that we have it. We have cornmeal mush, which is a hot cereal, but then once you're done with it, you let it set. Then you can cut it into pieces and you can fry it. So mm -hmm. that's fried mush. Then we got corn um, johnny cakes, pancakes that are made with cornmeal instead of wheat or buckwheat as usual, and then cornbread. This particular one I made today included some of the black cap raspberries that I picked. Ooh. And we have more black cap raspberries that were made. This is made with whole wheat flour, however, made into little hand pies. And then we have some purslane that uh, with a honey vinegar dressing to make a little bit of salad. So those are the leftovers. So that's what he's <laughs> gonna get for supper tonight. Our next stop was the blacksmith shop, which was built in 1830. One of the really interesting things that I, I realized now that we had been there one day and then the next day is that 
different historic interpreters are there on different days. So while the blacksmith was not there the first day we were there, he was there the second, and we got really excited because Steven also does blacksmithing, so to be able to see someone else do it and learn from them, it was super cool, and he was very, very nice. When you touch the metal to the coal, um, is when it heats it up. You see how quickly that fades. It's cold again. Yeah, you just keep putting it back in the fire and try not to get burned. <laughs> <laughs> Take on the flat and you chisel all the way up through. Yeah. Then you twist it. Oh. Then, so then on this one you do the same thing. You chisel all the way up through uh -huh. and twist it. Now you hammer it flat again the other way and chisel and turn it the other way. And then, so you twist it one way Right. Flatten it back out yep. and then chisel it, it. And, and then and if, if it's done properly, properly yeah, that's what you wind up with. That is beautiful. I mean, no, I, that was gorgeous. <laughs> like <laughs> for sure, I love that twist. Now, is that done on a square piece with that twist, or is yeah, that I, they've I, got that rounded I out? I think this one. See, this one's twisted the opposite way. I think they held it here, and then twisted twisted it here. Actually, they held it here and here and twisted because they're, they're double. It's the opposite, it's the opposite twist, you know what I mean? Yeah. This, is like that, this almost looks like someone's journeyman piece where they were like, hey, here's all the cool things I can do, can I Can, I, can, I, can I try this, yeah. yeah. Yeah, oh my goodness, you're right. Oh my goodness, you're right. They taught me how to make twine. One of the very interesting buildings there that showed a very interesting trade that I've never really seen exhibited at a living history museum before was the brewery and hops house, which was a reconstruction of an original brewery that was in New York at this time period. But this is a reconstruction, so it had a lot of really cool things and apparently they actually still brew stuff there. The person who was interpreting, the historical interpreter, said that it was not uh, safe for consumption, uh, but that he had a uh, you know, tried some and we got to smell a little bit, but you know, apparently it's a uh, not, not good beer that is made there. Actually at the bottom of the barrel is so that all the sediment basically collects below it. Oh, that's and smart. And you have clean beer above it. Very smart. So that's why. Today, the Genesee Country Village and Museum is the only living history museum that makes wood-fired, salt-glazed stoneware on site. The pottery made here can be seen in the kitchens all over the village and is also for sale in the Flint Hill store. Then just tie them off and let them dry for a week or so. So to turn these parts, this is the, we call this the H, and the kit down below, which I step on. When I step on, it spins the wood towards me, and then just simple tools from the blacksmith, and that's how you're going to cut the wood. It's a very straightforward, easy process. cut of course when it's coming down because there's not enough pressure, not enough power when it's going back up again. So you're only cutting when it's coming down towards you. You're very efficient wheel. And because it's such a high mass, it also has a lot of momentum. So it's easy to turn and actually when he lets go of it, it'll try and turn by itself. And there's of course a very small wheel up at your end which makes that hub turn that much faster. Yeah. And you'll see when I let go of this thing that it's It'll travel quite a ways by itself. And you have to be cautious not to walk into that moving hand. 
The Shakers built their own communities, isolating themselves from the world, so while this Shaker building is part of the Genesee Country Village and Museum, it would not have been seen outside a Shaker community in its time. This building would have been a center of business in the Shaker community, selling, well, Shaker-made goods. They made brooms, as you can see here. The Shakers also revolutionized the herb and seed industries of their day because they created well, packaged seeds, and also had some really interesting growing techniques which were on display outside. We are about to see a quilt that is being made as a reproduction of an anti-slavery quilt that would have been raffled off at an anti-slavery fair. In the United States of America mm -hmm. and the promise of freedom, mm -hmm. and then Job's Tears is the struggle for freedom, mm -hmm. and then this is the Underground Railroad Square, and that is path to freedom. And then Jacob's Ladder is the ascent from slavery. And then the, the uh, rising star represents the North Star, which is what they would follow mm -hmm. to head north. This was the boyhood home of George Eastman, whose name you might recognize because he was the founder of Eastman Kodak Company. The village even had a baseball field? which I thought was really cool and I had never seen anything like it. We then made our way back to the Gaslight District where we visited the Hyde House, which was built in 1870. Now, this is an incredibly interesting house from an architectural standpoint because it is an octagon house, which was a little bit of a fad in the late... 1800s where the house is literally built in the shape of an octagon. It was built by Mr. Hyde who was a homeopathic physician and his wife Julia and they were also spiritualists so seances were held in their home. We then went back to the Hamilton house to explore a little bit more.
wanted to show you what I got at the gift shop. All right, so of course I have all of the you know literature that they they gave me about like what's going on that day and the map of the place. Um, they had recipes that I also got that you saw in the video um, that I was thought was a super cool way um, to have like an experience continue at home in the, in the learning experience. Um, so that's all more of that stuff. Oh, they gave us a cool printed newspaper reproduction. So that was super cool. Um, the American Citizen, and it is the issue from uh, Rochester, New York, Tuesday, October 4th, 1842. So we can, you know, find out what was what was going on in Rochester then. Alright, so then here's more of the stuff that I got at the gift shop. So we'll start off with this. This is the Genesee County Village and Museum official guidebook. So I got this because it had a bunch of really nice pictures of the entire museum that I really like, especially this aerial one. Like, that's super cool. Like, I can't get that with my camera. Um, and it just went into even more detail than, I mean, of course, there's the, the historical interpreters went into a whole lot of detail there. But it's, you know, written so I can re re reference it and refer to it and kind of go back and remember exactly what it was and also, you know, remember what the names of all of the houses were and all of the um, buildings, which is helpful. All right. Now, this one is probably one of my favorite things that I got there. And it is an 1840s quilted hood pattern. So last summer I made my first 1840s style dress in the spirit of Jane Eyre. Um, and I don't have anything, I, I have like a bonnet that kind of works for 1840s, but it's not like perfect, perfect. Uh, so I thought this would be a really cool way to add to that outfit and to flesh out a little bit more of my 1840s wardrobe. And this one, it's it's a hood, um, so it's kind of like a, it's like a bonnet, but not, it's, and it's not like a cap because it's different. And so basically it's like, you know, a hood on your hoodie, but detachable. And that is what those, especially for cold weather, were called in the mid-1800s. So I really like this one. Um, I'm very excited. I am going to make it at some point. I don't know when exactly, but I mean, it's on my, it's on my list of things to make now. So I haven't opened it yet or anything, um, but this pattern will enable you to recreate an 1840s winter quilted hood in the Susan Green costume collection owned by the Genesee County Village and Museum. Stylistically, the quilted hood mimics bonnet styles indicative of the 1840s. It features the classic whole scuttle shape, which I honestly don't know what that means, and the low rounded cheek tabs, horizontal lines from the crown to the brim, and a horseshoe shaped silhouette. So that's really cool. So there's the picture on the front, and then there's another picture on the back. Um, so that was, this one is a reproduction of the hood pattern, and then the one on the front is the original one in the collection, so. I've also kind of, just recently, been more interested in quilting. I've never really truly made a quilt. I've pieced together some blankets, but then I never actually like physically quilted it, you know, doing the stitching. But this feels like it's something that I want to get into at some point, but not yet. But someday I really want to make a quilt. Okay, and then last but not least, as you can tell, I went a little overboard at the gift shop. I got very excited 
they had a lot of really cool stuff and I had a really cool time there and I learned a lot of things and I just wanted to continue that experience and have my souvenirs that I would use for different things. So. I got a mug like the ones that they made. Well, this it's not just like the ones that they made in the kiln or in the potter shop. It's like actually one that they made in the kiln at the village, which I think is super cool. So it's it's literally like one that I saw um, the historical interpreter making, which I just think is so cool. And I really like the design that they did on the front here. Um, with the, I'm, I think it's a flower. I'm pretty sure it's a flower. But I really like this one with the blue flower on the top. Uh, it has a nice glaze on the inside. I love how it has imperfections because you know that it was actually made by a human. And like, I can just think about like, you know, the person who made this, you know, at the museum now, but also people who would have made this, whose hands would have made this. It just like this a hundred years ago, 150 years ago, 170 years ago, going back. I mean, pottery's been around for a really, really long time. But I just think it's, it's super cool. And now I can drink my morning tea out of it and remember, you know, my time at the museum. Um, and then also just think about historical craftsmanship, which is really cool. Oh, we also got a bunch of honey sticks. Because they're really good. Oh, you want one? I think this one's peach. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on this journey with us. Visiting museums is a great thing to do. So much culture and learning and experience. I have a whole nother video about the museum part of the Genesee County Village and Museum. It's more like the museum part instead of the village part. This is really just a village part. Like, there's even more, y'all. It's so huge. It's one of my... Honestly, it was probably one of my favorite museums that I visited. It's really, really great. So, please like, comment, subscribe, all of that wonderful things that, you know, YouTubers ask you to do. And also, y'all, I have a Kofi now. And if you would like to support, you know, me going to museums and vlogging and taking y'all along, please consider, you know, buying me a coffee. It's, you're not actually buying me a coffee, it's just a thing that they say. But, you know, I also like coffee. So, the link's down below in the description box. Please consider checking that out. And until next time, bye!